Hello and welcome to Runkle and the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Last time I talked about the Stark decision, and there's a number of different applicants in that, uh, but I got the Stark copy first, so that's what I'm calling it at this stage. Uh, and I noted that I thought it was better reasoned than the decision of Judge Gorman. But some people said, well, how is that? And maybe you just like that one better because it agrees with you. So I thought maybe I should cover the decision of Judge Gorman out of Newfoundland and Labrador, and I can explain my thinking on this one a little bit. So this one is titled, In the manner of an application for a reference hearing made pursuant to Section 74 of the Firearms Act. I'm going to try to keep this video fairly brief, and to do that I'm going to skip over a lot of material here, in part because it's very similar to what we saw yesterday. But if you haven't watched that video, I'm going to try to link it here, and maybe you should check that out first. Anyway, skipping ahead, I'm skipping past all of this sort of initial introduction bit. They're covering a lot of the law. But I want to, and it's the same law that they that we covered last time. So I wanted to jump ahead to Mr. H's position. So Mr. H says that a revocation occurred, and as a result, the court does have jurisdiction to hear the Firearms Act reference. Uh, he refers to Black's Law Dictionary and the definition of revoke contained therein, uh, to annul and make void by recalling or taking back, to cancel, rescind, repeal, or reverse as a license or will. Mr. H submits, under any interpretation, the registrar is telling me that my registration certificate, which used to be valid, is no longer valid. Mr. H argues that it does not matter that the prescribed form for revocations was not used. He submits that, that is the effect that is important. And I kind of tend to think that that's a cor correct interpretation. When you're trying to determine what somebody's done, you know, did they use the correct form is not usually the test. It's what effect does it have? But uh, continuing on here, uh, as Mr. H uh, aptly put it in his brief, I used to have a registration certificate. Now I don't, says the Registrar of Firearms. Mr. H notes that the notice came from the registrar and that the notice indicates that the previous registration certificates are automatically nullified. Mr. H submits that this establishes that the registrar made a decision to revoke his registration certificate and thus this court has jurisdiction to consider his Section 741 application and refers to the cases of Porter and Fair, which you may recognize because I've covered them here as well. In Porter, uh, the accused was charged with a number of offenses, including having possession of a restricted firearm without having a registration certificate for the firearm. And I'm going to skip ahead here to just note, in the course of her decision, Justice Dorgan noted that Section 71.2 of the Firearms Act provides for the automatic revocation of registration certificates in one specific situation, which is not applicable here. The existence of this provision emphasizes that other than this exception, no revocations are automatic, and must be done according to the procedure set out in the Act. Mr. H argues that similarly, an automatic process of law does not revoke a registration certificate, as Section 71 is clear that no revocations are automatic, except for one situation. Now, in my view, that's not quite the, uh, the correct thing here. It's just that there are automatic revocation processes, but they have to actually show which one they're using. And I don't think they can because there isn't one here. So the judge says, I agree that a revocation must be done in accordance with the law. The question remains, however, was uh, revoked by the firearms register or a chief firearms officer, or was it revoked as a result of an amendment to a regulation? And in FAIR, uh, they're talking about a lifetime firearm prohibition. This is a question about the inherent jurisdiction to uh, supplement the legislation to prevent an injustice and avoid an absurdity. And the court notes... As I will subsequently explain, a judge of the provincial court does not have such inherent power. And so basically, FAIR is a case that says, in extreme circumstances, a judge can sort of fix big problems. I don't think FAIR is really the big case here, but fair ball. Uh, Crown's position. Uh, so the Crown takes the position that the court does not have jurisdiction to consider Mr. H's reference. Uh, the Crown argues that neither the Registrar nor a Chief Firearms Officer made a decision that is reviewable pursuant to Section 74.1 of the Firearms Act. Uh, that position is set out in the brief in the following matter. Uh, they say, It is the submission of the Attorney General of Canada that the reclassification of the applicant's restricted firearm to a prohibited 
and the invalidation of the applicant's previously held registration certificate for a restricted firearm was a result of the criminal code regulatory amendments that came into force on May 1, 2020, and not as a result of an administrative decision of the registrar. Also, too, the letter sent by the registrar on July 20, 2020, does not represent a decision uh, by the registrar regarding the applicant's registration certificate, but was an information-only letter. Accordingly, it is the submission of the Attorney General that this court does not have jurisdiction to conduct a reference hearing in accordance with Section 74 sub 1 of the Firearms Act with respect to the matters at issue. If the applicant wishes to challenge the Governor and Council's order and Council promulgating the amendment regulations, his proper remedy lies in a judicial review to the Federal Court of Canada, not with an application to the Provincial Court of Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, this seems to me to be a different issue here. He's not trying to challenge or you know, the jurisdiction question isn't challenging the order in council. It's actually challenging the the notice that was provided and the the step taken in terms of the revocation. So this is mixing the issues here, in my view. Uh, at any rate, uh, there's uh, currently seven judicial review applications before the federal court in Calgary, Toronto, and Ottawa, and a similar application before the Court of Queen's Bench in Alberta and Calgary, challenging the amending regulations on constitutional and other grounds. The substantive issues the applicant seeks to raise are already being litigated in the proper forum in Superior Court and in the Federal Court of Canada. In support of their position, they refer to a number of cases, and the ones the court uh, cites are Whitmore and Drader. We'll uh, see a little bit more about this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. So in Drader, the applicant, who possessed a firearm registration certificate, had been ordered to enter into a Section 810 Criminal Code Recognizance, which is typically called a peace bond. So this recognizance contained a condition that prohibited from possessing firearms. This automatically resulted in the applicant being temporarily, pre or being temporarily prohibited him from possessing a registration certificate. The language there is a little awkward. The applicant applied to the provincial court seeking a Section 74 reference, which was dismissed, and Court of Queen's Bench upheld the dismissal, saying that they didn't have jurisdiction to consider the reference because the loss of a right to possess a prohibited weapon occurred through the operation of law and the provisions of the legislation do not permit a review. Now, uh, the reason why I don't think this is a great argument here is that uh, Drader was considered by the uh, by the other decision, and the problem with this is that when you're put on a Section 810 recognizance or some other court order that bans you from having firearms, there is actually a provision in the code that at that point automatically nullifies your registration certificates and your licenses and so forth. So that was done through legislation in a way that actually automatically nullifies it. Whereas this is a different situation because there is no legislation that nullifies it. So this argument here does seem to have a bit of a problem. Uh, in Whitmore, the enactment of the Firearms Act resulted in handguns being uh, reclassified from restricted weapons to prohibited weapons. So this would be certain handguns, not all handguns. Uh, so this required an application for a certificate in order to legally possess a handgun. And it was taken to provincial court. And they said, in considering the matter, the provincial court held that revocation requires the exercise of judgment or discretion in light of particular facts. This is also the language that's used in the Stark decision. So they're not disagreeing as to what the law is here. It's the application of it. So the cases cited by Mr. Humphreys and his excellent brief were very helpful and of significant assistance to me. Less helpful. So this is the court getting a little snarky was a copy of a letter that was filed as a purported precedent. This letter was written by a court attendance supervisor of the Provincial Court of New Brunswick. And I've also got a video on this, which I guess I'll try to link here. Uh, in the letter, the supervisor advises an applicant seeking a reference under Section 74.1 of the Firearms Act that the court has no jurisdiction to accept your request for review. And so this, these are the letters that basically said, you can't bring your matter into court because we've already decided against you on the jurisdiction question, which is not how the court system should work. So attached to the letter and also filed is a copy of an email sent by a federal Crown prosecutor in Quebec asking the supervisor whether the letter sent to the applicant was written by a specific provincial court judge and formatted and signed by the supervisor on the court's behalf. Surprisingly, 
Uh, the supervisor replies to this email by indicating, yes, that is correct. Judge blank wrote the letter attached and I formatted and signed it on the court's behalf. You might be wondering why Judge Gorman would have blanked out the name. And it's because the actions of that judge are, in my view, and in apparently the court's view here, because the court would not, uh, I don't think the court would be redacting a judge's name, uh, but for having some criticisms and some issue with what was happening there. Uh, I certainly don't view it as proper. Uh, the letter and emails have no value as precedent. They do not constitute a judgment. I would suggest that Crown Counsel refrain from filing such material in the future. During his submissions, Mr. Humphreys recognized that this material had no value. So, if you can think of the moment in Fight Club, you know, maybe you should stop bringing me every piece of garbage that comes across your desk, is sort of what the judge is saying here. And when the judge is saying that, you know, and that this material has no value and that they should refrain from filing such material in the future um, about the comments of another or the actions of another court. Yeah, that's a bit of a, a thing. I would also suggest that issues of jurisdiction should be subject to arguments, submissions in court and judicial consideration and decision rather than being decided on the equivalent of a post-it note. That's some harsh condemnation of in the court in New Brunswick and the steps they took there. So in my view, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty damning. Uh, so continuing on. So now they're going to go into the analysis. We're going to see actually what the judge is deciding here. So if Mr. H's registration certificate was revoked by the registrar or chief firearms officer, then I must determine whether the revocation was justified. But this is a jurisdiction question, so first you have to determine whether it's revoked. I've got a problem here in terms of the analysis, but continuing on. Crown argues that Mr. H's registration certificate was not revoked. Rather, it was nullified by legislative enactment. Now, are those two different things? Let's have a look. The word revoke has been defined as meaning to state officially that an agreement, right, or legal document is no longer effective. Thus, it could be argued that the change in regulation effectively revoked Mr. H's registration certificate. However, it is not necessary for me to determine this issue because I do not have jurisdiction to hear this application. Oh man, this is a problem. So this is a problem because it is necessary to determine this issue in order to determine if the court has jurisdiction. This here represents, in my view, a, a substantial legal error. So this bit here is where I think the judge has started to go off the rails in terms of analyzing this issue. But continuing on, the provincial court is a court of statutory jurisdiction. It has been noted that it is well established that the provincial court is a statutory court and therefore has only the jurisdiction vested in it or a judge thereof by legislation. So what this means is that provincial court can only hear matters that legislation says it can hear. So if you want to take something into provincial court, you need legislation that points you to how you get to provincial court, which is what he's relying on with Section 74 of the Firearms Act. Thus, this court has the powers conferred by statute and to a limited extent, common law powers can be inferred in order to allow the court to control its processes. Therefore, in order to hear and consider the application filed by Mr. H, I must have the statutory authority to do so. In this case, my statutory authority to hear a reference is found in Section 74 of the Firearms Act. As we have seen, Section 74 of the Firearms Act allows a provincial court judge to hear a reference only if a registration certificate has been revoked by the registrar or a chief firearms officer. In this case, that did not occur. Mr. H's registration certificate was canceled, revoked, or nullified by legislative action. If the court could please point to what law actually allows for the revocation, that's the problem here. So this occurred as a result of an order in council, not a decision of the registrar or a chief firearms officer. Thus, there is nothing for this court to review. You see, the court is not actually addressing the issue of whether or not there was a revocation here. Uh, and... You know, they're saying that it was canceled, revoked, or nullified by legislative action. I want to, like, show your homework. I want to see how they're saying it was canceled. 
because I can't find anything in the Firearms Act or elsewhere that provides for that. So absent that, it's hard to see how this legislative action actually cancels the certificate. This point can be illustrated by considering the orders that Section 76 of the Firearms Act allows the court to issue and the test to be applied. So Section 76 allows the court to confirm the decision of the Chief Firearms Officer or the Registrar to direct the Chief Firearms Officer or Registrar to issue a registration certificate or to cancel the revocation of the registration certificate. The difficulty here is that since neither the Registrar nor a Chief Firearms Officer made a decision, there's nothing to confirm, cancel, or review. But you can't use that, you can't use this, you can't say there is no decision to establish that there's no decision. That's circular logic. You know, there's a problem here in that he's assuming his conclusion. <sighs> okay, so I'm not a big fan of this, and I don't think that this carries a lot of weight. I think this shows, in part, why the uh, why the follow-up decision in Stark uh, dismisses this case without a whole lot of sort of going over it. There is no decision which can be assessed to determine if it was justified. In addition, if I were to issue an order directing that a registration certificate be issued, I would be ordering the registrar to issue a registration certificate for a prohibited weapon. Except that's not the order that would be appropriate here. You just cancel the revocation. Again, he's assuming his conclusions, which is circular logic, which is bad. I mean, that's just the long and short of it. This is not strong reasoning, in my view. The authority to issue such a certificate rests with the registrar or a chief firearms officer. This requires an application and a decision, neither of which has occurred. It doesn't require an application because this is a revocation. There's never a, an application made that starts off a revocation. And a decision. Again, he's assuming that no decision has been made. And his evidence for that is that no decision has been made. So in summary, in the absence of a decision having been made by the registrar or a chief firearms officer, this court does not have jurisdiction to consider a reference made pursuant to section 74 sub 1 of the Firearms Act. In addition, this court does not have the authority to make formal declarations that a law is of no force or effect under section 52 sub 1 of the Constitution Act, which is not where we are yet because this is just a jurisdiction question. So he's jumping the gun. So, for the reasons provided, Mr. H's application for a reference pursuant to Section 74 sub 1 of the Firearms Act is dismissed, judgment accordingly. So, this is my big problem with this case, in terms of looking at it, is that, again, it's circular logic. It says, no decision has been made, and we know this because no decision has been made. Compare and contrast with the Stark decision, which engages with the legislation, it engages with the language, it engages with the arguments that are made because this one doesn't seem to actually engage with the arguments made by the applicant. You know, the applicant is making arguments about the language and about, you know, citing case law and noting that there is no other way to, to cancel it. And the judge just doesn't get there. He doesn't consider these issues. So in my view, this is a very weakly reasoned decision. And so I think that faced with this decision, which the logic on it is very problematic in comparison with the Stark decision, which shows its homework, it shows what it's doing. It comes to conclusions based on evidence and evidence that isn't just the conclusion. I, I don't see how this one can stand up. I think that this is a much worse decision overall. And hopefully I've sort of showed why. Uh, this isn't just that I don't like this decision. It's that the reasoning in this decision is badly flawed. It's, it's a circular argument. It doesn't cover the applicants, uh, you know, what the applicant is arguing. And so how is a court supposed to hold this up as an example of the proper reasoning here? I don't think that uh, this is a very strong precedent for that reason. I think that there's a lot of grounds to be argued for the court not to follow this uh, Judge Gorman decision. And 
ultimately we'll see because there's more of these pending and both the Stark decision and the, uh, the this decision are going to be cited. It's going to be a drag out fight and it's going to be something that ultimately, as I've said before, this one's going to the Supreme Court. That's my read on this. There's too many court decisions from too many jurisdictions which are not going to agree. And so ultimately the Supreme Court is going to have to make the call as to how the law applies here. And I hope they come down the right way because if the Supreme Court comes down the wrong way, it could basically end the value of Section 74 uh, for the use of the, you know, people who are having facing revocations or refusals or the like. It'll allow them to play the sort of games as it was described in previous case law. And I really hope that's not the ultimate conclusion, but we'll see. And I'm going to be in on this fight. We'll see how it goes. So anyway, so thank you for watching. If you found this to be educational or informative, please like the video. Please share it with your friends. Subscribe to see more content. Uh, I normally, you know, there's a cognitive bias that can kick in where you see a case that agrees with you. And so you're more likely to find that case to be a good case. And some people were suggesting that maybe that's what I was doing here. And that is something you always have to, to consider. Uh, you always have to try to come to cases with a clear head. And I think that notwithstanding that I prefer the result of the Stark case to this one, I also think that it's demonstrably better in terms of how it's reasoned, how it gets to its conclusions. And I'm really glad to see that because... I want to rely on the Stark case and I want to be arguing that that one should carry the day. It's got all the things that I want to be able to point a judge to, to say, use this case, don't use that case. And it helps that the Stark case was decided afterwards and also considers the Gorman case and points out the places where Gorman got it wrong, where they misread case law, where they seem to have gone off track. So anyway, want to thank uh, my Patreon supporters at the $10 level, my buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, uh, Mark D, General Counsel of CCFR, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Jean Alexandre Tessier, Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter H, Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys Are for Boys, Ian Vaughn, Leland Wreckage, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, Michelle Stotzel, Scott Sweetman, Mike Rhodes, DF, Stacey Cartmel, Tactical Advantage TV, uh, Canada, Ian S, Dave Leslie, Juan, Donald Duncan, Darren Duell, Sean Crane, Ian Hutchinson, Rory, Travis, BC Bushcraft Leather, John Singarty, Misa Komarevich, David Moga, and uh, at sorry, Ian Hedjdanek. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I will ask for a follow-up uh at the $20 level, Kevin Fleet and Dale Nesbitt, and at the $50 level, Demo and People of Canada. Once again, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope I've armed you with knowledge. See you next time.